All right, I think we're I think we're live. Yeah, well done. I think. <laughs> I don't know. This is round two. Red, the red lights on. I think we're good. Yeah, hopefully everybody can hear us. So thanks for joining us, uh, guys. We wanted to take this opportunity and really uh, go through and dissect some of the things that are on the uh, the website. So Viper.com, and we posted 55 exercises on uh, on the website, and we wanted to take this opportunity and go through some of the construct and then some of the exercises because I know we get a lot of questions on the exercise themselves. Um, so, you know, DP, let's uh, maybe start off by telling everyone why we chose the themes that we did and what those actually mean. Sure. Uh, so when, we, when we're thinking about programming, designing a workout, or actually mapping an overall program, uh, we always consider these six major programming themes. Mobility, activation, recovery, strength, power, and metabolic conditioning. And then within, underneath the umbrella of those six main pillars, there are subsets to those. So we know that for strength, there's many forms of strength. For power, there's many forms of power. Same thing can be said about metabolic conditioning, et cetera. So whenever we're putting something together, we're always thinking of those six main themes. And then when we're, we're designing the workout, especially with Viper Pro, is we're thinking about what movement skills am I trying to enhance around those six main things. So for example, we can do rotary-based exercise in all six of those things. Right. And because if I pick a theme, it will then dictate how I might execute those particular tasks uh, with Viper Pro. And that kind of underscores our program programming design as well. So if we're thinking about warm-up drills, uh, working block drills, and cool-down drills, we can start to slot activation patterns in a warm-up and a cool-down depending on what the individual wants as a goal and what their physiological readiness is, uh, we can certainly map those out. Same with mobility, same with metcon, same with power and strength. So they kind of become the building blocks for the warm-up, uh, the cool-down, and the working units within a program or a periodization model, right? So, yeah, so did you want to add something to that? Uh, no, I think just in terms of our programming hat-on, uh, especially unique to Viper Pro, is we're often considering the, the skill at hand, the movement skill, versus primarily focusing on muscle. So like for today, the way we're doing this video is Monday. We know that's National Chest Day, or for many people that's National Leg Day because all the benches are taken, but the squat rack isn't. So if that's the case, uh, for us, loaded movement day means, well, what skills do I want to load and enhance about the body? And then there's variable ways to do so, and we're going to start by considering those six themes that we just described. Great. Uh, so why don't we start off with an activation pattern that's on our website right now, okay? And this one was pretty popular, right? This is one that uh, we were discussing kind of candidly. Uh, we had, there was videos being taken of us, and we didn't quite know that was happening, but it was cool. And it was a strategy that would help us um, essentially activate and fortify stability around a split stance posture where load was not centered but actually away from our midline. So it looks something like this, right? So you, we had, I believe, was it, it was a neutral grip. We'll go neutral for now, we can always progress it. And then we had a split stance, right? And I'll do it from a couple different views here. So we're in a split stance. My back foot's just on my toes. And then my front foot's flat. Most of my weight's on my front foot. I'm holding the Viper in a neutral grip. And then what we did was we came down to the ground and then moved the mass away from midline in the frontal plane. And to accommodate that, you can probably see how my hip shifted, right? So instead of being here, to accommodate this shift in the frontal plane, my hip moved in the opposite direction to help decelerate that. So Michelle, what muscle, or well, there's a lot of muscles, but which one's really turning on primarily to help decelerate? Well, you think glutes and foot, but if you go back to your idea of let's not work on muscles, let's work on the task, maybe the best way to describe this is pronation or deceleration of pronation. So if the skill is I need to decelerate pronation because I'm a runner, I'm a walker, I'm a, uh, you know, I umbulate in life, yeah. uh, to effectively deal with ground reaction force, all the muscles, you know, from the trunk all the way down, arguably from the entire body, are synergized to decelerate ground reaction force as it dives and caves in. 
And so what we're doing is we're actually creating an environment with a load, in this case the Viper Pro, to accentuate the effects of deceleration, therefore creating a strategy where the body has to self-organize to say, we got to decelerate this uh, to a greater degree, right? So big toe, medial arch, all the muscles of the leg, the thigh into the posterior hip are all there to synergize to say, okay, we're going to put on the brakes as, in this, in this case, you're driving a mass into the midline of the forward foot, in this case, your left foot. So that would be a strategy where we don't want to disrupt spine mechanics. So what you're doing is, in effect, you're adducting the hip or abducting the pelvis. It's going that way, right? right? You're closing the hip joint and you're driving towards me. And then you're keeping that kite pattern, that tall spine wide shoulder, will be called kite pattern, in through the back in order to facilitate this. So that's a great strategy for glute if we want to talk muscle. But if we want to talk task, it is deceleration of pronation. So anything that decelerates pronation is going to get a greater effect. Uh, so if we kind of put our lens to a different uh, uh, demographic, and we think older adults, yeah. right, they have to also decelerate pronation yeah. in an effective way. But let's keep a, a, maybe a safer environment. So we'll put the Viper on end. We'll still tilt it medial to the forward foot, right? But now we've got a scenario where the individual feels safer because they're grabbing three points of contact, forward foot, back foot, and then their hand, their right hand, in this case, on the viper to the ground. So that would be the same kind of strategy. Range of motion could be self-selected, but for falls prevention, older adult ability, phenomenal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which, if we want to talk about athletic development, let's take out an offset grip. So what DP is going to do is he's going to have a slot hold right here on his right hand, left hand's on the end, and you're going to go into that one leg balance, right? So you can actually hover with that back, back foot if you want to go one leg balance. So you're going to load into that. At this point, your back knee can come in contact with the Viper DP. And what you're going to do is you're going to do a self ward. So what you can't see on camera is he is driving his knee into the Viper Pro and holding it. And then he would come back. Oh, right. A couple seconds on that one. <laughs> so what, what happens there is not only the hip flexor on the one side, but the posterior glute on the opposite side is creating that force closure yeah. on the pelvis. So spine is tall, the knee is tracking over the confines, so the left knee is tracking over the confines of the foot. You're taking that back knee off the ground and you're driving it and holding it into the vice pro. And you're holding it there for a count of three, and then you're releasing. So you're teaching the muscles to activate, so to turn on and to turn off, right? And one thing that we always say about activation strategies is you want to do both. You want to teach the muscle to depolarize and turn on, and then repolarize and turn off in order to be effective. Because time and attention is great for cross-sectional development, but athleticism is always about turning off quick. Right, And whether you're a high-level athlete on the field of play or an older adult, because we're going to kind of play those two realms, uh, you're going to be able to establish athleticism based on your age, your competencies, and your environment. Right? Because athleticism at 85 for me means not falling. Right? right? At 25, it may mean you know executing a higher play on the field with more um, competency. Yeah. Right. So either one of those. And then what we can do to progress that is as you have that ward, so let me do it without a micro. So I'm here, I ward, and then I actually drive when the ward is still on, I drive into triple extension. Right. Or excuse me, triple extension if I want to go back foot, and certainly maintaining triple flexion on that forward side. So let's try that again. So you're gonna stay low, drive the knee in, stay low, stay low. Now come up with that ward. Keep warding and come up. Perfect. And then you let go and turn off. Right? So you would drive, maintain that low position, knee in, ward, and then keep warding as you drive up. Yep. So that would be an activation pattern for foot, um, for leg, for thigh, posterior hip and trunk, for the task of deceleration of pronation, and the muscles involved would be trunk, posterior hip, so glute, all the way down to medial foot. So I love that. I think from a, if we were to simplify that a little bit, for somebody who's not as savvy with biomechanics. Let's say our clients are our athletes. Right? You know, a big win here is I'm thinking ACL right. prevention st type strategies right. or re uh, re uh, reconditioning. Right. Because, and I like this because it's usually in the environment that's similar to where somebody gets hurt. So oftentimes when we do 
ACL prevention stuff. And there's nothing wrong with this, but it's often in positions and actions to where it wasn't the, the space to where I ended up getting hurt. Yeah. I.e., I lie on my side and I do clams to activate my glute medius. But in this case, the glute medius is turning on to help me decelerate this action, which is a completely different motor task at hand. And I think there might be a little bit more carryover. I mean, I'm thinking you combine the two. Yeah, see, that's a smart ACL progression. That's what I'm thinking, right? So if you say, okay, the task of motor learning is to establish, let's say, a connection, a neural connection to the lateral hip, uh, an effective strategy would be a clamp or something of that nature. And then as you organize discrete inputs together, right, and get a more complex motor task than what we did here, that's a nice progression strategy of going kind of local to global in a way that makes sense from a motor learning perspective for an individual. Right. So we have both in our toolbox right. at that point, right? And what we're doing now is we're just saying in the environment, uh, and in, in the environment where the mechanism of injury took place, you know, can we actually start to progress to that level and allow the body to self-organize that task so that the big toe can help the hip, can help the trunk decelerate that action in concert with each other as a full body, yeah, and like anything else, that's all about regressions and progression strategies within a framework. Cool. Uh, I see a couple questions on there from the distance. Can you read them out? I can't read that. Oh, I can't read that now either. <laughs> uh, no, just a couple of great comments. Uh, thank you, Joe. He like says, here to learn and level up my Viper knowledge. Thank you so much for doing this. It is our pleasure. Uh, Paul uh, Hoyos, sorry if I'm pronouncing your name incorrectly. I was trying this pattern for more than two weeks for myself and my students, and we all have enhanced a better posture and aware of stabilization of the hips and knees and overall balance. So awesome. I'm glad that you were able to take that and run with it. That's what this is all about, right, is just sharing ideas and, and going and doing these strategies so we can all become more resilient. I appreciate those, those comments, and comments and questions are both welcome. So uh, even and even challenge, you know, I think that, what we always say is we want to create a space haven uh, for folks to challenge and to discuss. And I think that if we can't create that and have a substantive, respectful uh, narrative and discussion, then, then the question is, what are we trying to do? Right. And, uh, and so we want all of those comments, uh, the questions that ensue, uh, some comments and challenges that come in. And we're happy to have that, you know, as long as the, the tone is respectful and, and, uh, and substantive, which it always is in our community. We're very thankful for that. So. You want to move on to some mobility strategies? We do. Uh, David Weck just uh, posted and said he wants to set up a date soon. Oh, good. Hey, let's let's do it. And for those that don't know, I mean, and don't follow, which would be very few because everybody knows who David Weck is. Um, a fabulous individual, fabulous human being who has his head and heart in the right place. So thanks for that, uh, David. We're going lighter now? <laughs> um, after that one, I have to go lighter. I'm going to do this. So yeah, this is going to be the... Uh, the bolt. The bolt. So what we did is we had fun with naming these, uh, and you know the classic pose that Usain Bolt uh, does after his race is certainly one that uh, is yeah is is mimicked in this pattern. So what we like to say often is that mobility, stability, and strength can be actually trained together, so that we can reinforce tissue extensibility. We can actually mitigate against threat, which typically causes muscle tightness, because if we're moving into a pattern under load. What the body has to do is coordinate and self-organize the task such that there is stability and positional strength. And if we do it at sub-maximal loads, that affords not only greater extensibility, but from the nervous system's position, ownership. And by ownership, I mean, I, I own this motion now, yeah. right? Because I've loaded it, I have stability and positional strength as we develop mobility. Right. And one of these protocols is really through the pelvis. So if I'm... If I'm dipping towards one side, it's my left side, what we would see is tissue extensibility coming in on the lateral, excuse me, the medial line of anatomy. So my back leg, the medial compartment is getting a stretch. That extends through the pelvic floor and the opposite glute. So functionally speaking, any type of tightness or restriction in one side of the abductors is gonna translate in lack of translation in the frontal plane to my pelvis to the opposite side thereby minimizing any type of stretch or loading of the opposite glute. So medial thigh and opposite glute, or posterior hip, is really related, and they are operating in the same kind of, you know, 
functional line, so to speak. That's right. And pelvic floor too. So let's go back to the older adult. Incontinence uh, is a, a, a major issue. And it's one that we can prevent by going into some extensibility and some strength training, some mobility training for the pelvic floor. Because as we age, typically our gait pattern is right here. So we're not getting the can of transduction in through the medial thigh and pelvic floor. So I'm going to take a, uh, an offset hold, so slot here and then wide on this side, which means that my, my body is going to go to my left. And my hands are going to extend either at knee height, waist, or shoulder overhead. And I'm going to extend it in the opposite direction. And then I'm going to come back. So what happens here is my pelvis is going in one direction, and my hands are going in the opposite direction. And that force has to be transmitted by my pelvis and my abdominal wall. And I'm going to sink in to the pattern by lowering my pelvic floor thereby getting a little bit more stretch to the adductor and the glute, right? So I can regress that by, again, we go back to tilt. So I can tilt this particular pattern, so I'm getting a little bit more stability, not as much load to my body. And then I can graduate by going low. I can go at waist, or I can go overhead. When I go overhead, there's more load to my trunk. When I go at uh, floor height, there's actually more stretch in through the adductors and the glute. So those are all uh, exercise uh, progressions and regressions off this idea of mobilizing the, uh, the pelvis and then um, the adductors in your thigh. So I think going along those lines, you know, uh, if we take it up a notch. So he's using a pretty light load to accomplish that. Again, so that way we can lower the threat mechanisms and he can move into that space. Because for us, when we talk about mobility, we're talking about creating and moving into while controlling this new space within the body. And so for a lot of people in the frontal plane to be able to create all this space in through the hips and through the pelvis, uh, it becomes important then that we start to load it lightly at first so we learn how to control that space. Uh, but then the extra tension will also uh, add that additional challenge to the motor system. So that way the motor system can understand, yep, yeah, there's a lot of force running through the body, but I know how to control that. And that's important because if I'm always doing this unloaded or without uh, an external mass, I will only be good at those motor tasks while unloaded, but then you can load the system. It's, a, it's almost a different motor task when you have the external mass to go around. Right, and, and more coordination will be upregulated when there's more load to a certain degree. So inter and intramuscular coordination, if it is more proficient, that decreases threat, right? And threat is typically uh, responded to by tightness. Think about walking on ice for us Canadians, right? You walk on ice, there's a threat, everything tightens up, right? And so what we want to do is, in a progressive manner over time, add a little bit of load to increase stability, positional strength, and extensibility thereby your nervous system owns that particular range of motion with safety, control, and strength, right, force generation. And then so that, now that we've earned the permission to do that, then we would tackle a similar movement there for strength with the intended uh, target of time under tension into specific tissues. Right. And so, oh, we got to load you up now. <laughs> we got to load you up. So we got to go a little heavier because we're talking strength. Yeah. And then feet together here, Michelle. And this is the one where we're going to pre-position the arms out in front, call this the salute. And then from that position, as he takes this mass away from midline, and he's holding it there, then can he step away into a very similar position that we got from the mobility drill? Awesome. And so a myriad of benefits to this. Here's one of the, I think the, the things that stand out for me as a coach. It would be that I'm strengthening tissue while it's lengthened. Normally, we do a lot of compressive-based exercise on our muscular system, uh, or on our tissues, for that matter. But in this case, the, we're looking to fortify strength into tissues while being able to maintain a mass away from midline, which requires our body to be long in many positions. Right. So not only through the lower extremity for Michelle, but also now think of the upper extremity that has to get long as well. And everything has to get long together as a team 
So it's a synergy of all these tissues together that will help fortify strength now in a very unique position. And we call these pre-position exercises. So we're positioning the, uh, the mass, in this case the Viper Pro, and we're holding it there isometrically and then requiring body segments to move, in this case, underneath. So if we're thinking about tasks and muscles, let's play both of those games. Muscles clearly through the arms and through the shoulders, they tighten through the upper trunk to the mid trunk to the pelvis, and then of course down the leg. So you might say, what muscles are you training? You'd say, from grip strength all the way down to floor, and it kind of makes it a full body exercise. The task at hand would be, can I create stability and mobility or motion and I'm holding a certain, you know, mass. In this case, it's a, it's a load in the gym, but it could be something outside. And I've got the motor control and the stability to be able to hold something and then move with it, right? Because often what we would see in life is the tasks at hand require that I hold a mass still and I move around with it. Right. How many times have you done chores and you've got to hold okay. a pot and I said baby, off the baby Jackson, right? right? So I got a one and a half year old. And what am I doing with that one and a half year old? I'm, I'm carrying him here, right? And then, oh, I got to pick something off the ground. So I got to squat down. I got to be able to move dynamically while holding a mass on one side of my body that's wiggling around. That's typically too, right? And I have to be resilient enough to do that without my body breaking down to accomplish that particular task. So core control. Uh, is key. It's a little bit more, let's say, um, progressive. Uh, so there's your false prevention holder at all. Uh, the athlete is going to mirror this too because can I have the competency and the skill to be able to hold my body segments stable but be still nimble in my movements, yeah. right? And that's what you described. I still need to maintain some stability against the mass that I'm holding, let's say it's jacks, and then I've got to go and mobilize my body Think about any athletic endeavor right. where I've got to hold something still right. Right, right, or a body. Okay, right. now, so basketball playoffs are on, right? That's right. So now, posting up, right, you're not going to be flat footed because if you are, you're out of the play. Right. So you have to be in motion, right, but you have to keep me at base. So, right. Right? Yeah. so I'm here, you've got to maintain some stability here, but guess what your feet are doing? They have to be in motion, right? Most athletic endeavors require that if your feet are flat, you're out of the play. Right? So can you actually be moving around on the balls of the feet, still have some control, and be reactive to whatever environment you're looking at? So let me see. Yeah. I'm going to take this. It looks like we got some good comments and questions. I'm going to take a look at that. Yeah. You want to grab some water? Do I need some? <laughs> <laughs> I can use some. Okay. Thanks, bud. <laughs> All right. Uh, if not, we're going to power. So, uh, Paul Holyo, he uh, asked, what, what I would love to explain a little bit more, it's about how to involve more of the stabilization and working pelvic floor muscles on elder people as I'm more elder uh, people engaged into my classes. So what we want to do is we say, okay, whatever muscles we're looking at, your water back there, uh, whatever musculature we're looking at, we can act, we can do two things, and both have efficacy. Uh, the first one is we can try to activate muscles uh, through various different coaching cues and positions and squeezing and some kind of cognitive approaches that are conscious in nature, uh, or we can set up an environment and let the body self-organize the task. So remember that glute strategy we did where we're here. And we went into that pattern, we came back up, and you're awarding into the viper. Um, we didn't necessarily call upon the glutes and have you squeeze your glutes. You didn't need to, right? The environment took care of that on its own, right? So we set up a scenario where we have to decelerate against ground, and this area of the body was favored to do it, and then the body self-organized the task. When it comes to pelvic floor, what we can do is we don't have to necessarily do the kegels, uh, or the squeezing, although that is one scenario that has a certain effect. We can consciously move that area. What we can also do with the older adults is a lot of tilt patterns as we've kind of alluded to in this discussion so far. And then what we can do is change our foot pattern. So we're going to go wide to enhance the ability to create some length in the tissue, mechanical length. 
And when we've got mechanical length, we've got mechanical transduction. This idea that stress in this area, because I'm stretching it, is going to start to uh, is going to begin the process of remodeling. And that abductor into pelvic floor is a relationship that we can get when we go wide with the feet. So I can have a variety of different ways to move with mass now. So I, if I have a wide one here, I can just go to one side, a okay, wide stance, and I can drive the, uh, the Viper Pro forward anteriorly. And then if I drive my hand towards the base, I'm actually getting some length in through the posterior, or let, let's say the, um, the stance leg, my lunging leg being the right, the stance being the left. I'm driving down towards the base of the Viper Pro, and I come back, or I can actually just accentuate now trunk stability by tilting it to the side and reaching up. Now I'm requiring that there is more stretch and therefore more engagement, not only nervously, so neurologically I'm turning things on, right, feel it, but then you're putting more length onto the tissues to promote that idea of remodeling. Same thing is true in the sagittal plane. I can set up my body in the sagittal plane a little bit wider if balance is an issue. I'm on the big toe, little toe, and heel on the, fore, the forefoot, or excuse me, the, the front leg. And then I'm on the forefoot of my trail leg. And from here, I can actually go through and drop the pelvis of my right side down, creating more effect on the lateral hip, and I can drive up. So now what I'm doing is I'm enhancing pelvic floor with my Y. I'm enhancing lateral hip with this one. And overall, I am now putting more forces through the lumbar pelvic hip complex in order for fibroblast activity to increase, motor control to increase, and uh, upregulation of nervous system and muscle to increase. So I'm adding more uh, resiliency to that area through muscle, connective tissue, and neural drive. Love it. So, you know, those are some strategies that we would look at. Can we, and we can go to kneeling and everything else too, but those are some quick kind of go-to exercises and thoughts that might benefit all of us, particularly as we age. And to that point, Michelle, and, and to answer your question, Paul, um, I think really specific, here's what you can do. That same drill, that favorite glute exercise we've been playing with, uh, you go into a tilt position for your elderly population, and then we add variability to that by tweaking the hands or the feet. So we go sit up here, and we, we would do same arm, but we can then progress them to the opposite arm reaching across which then would facilitate more rotation through the trunk. Slightly different motor task, but it's around the same fundamental premise of this particular stance. And then we could drive, instead of to the side, we drive forward, we could drive back. It's all about for the elderly population. Put them in a safe environment so the tilt position does that. And then you can start to drive and facilitate different angles of stress so all that one becomes known, which helps with balance. And then, too, as you're talking about, that starts to fortify uh, greater tissue strength as well. Even that freehand. That right? freehand. If you're, yeah. if you're here and you're tilting, and that becomes one exercise, just by taking the hand and lifting it up and leaving it up there, now it creates a different response into the trunk and shoulder and right pelvis as well. So, yeah, some Perfect. things to have to think about. Hopefully that helps you, Paul. Uh, Scott Bisbee mentioned, you can basically do these exercises with the old vipers, too. These particular ones, absolutely. Uh, David Wack, it's going to be challenging to challenge you boys. First requirement will be having uh, the pretty deep understanding of the body and biomechanics to have the conversation. Well, that's a huge uh, compliment coming for you, my friend, so thank you for that. Uh, Andy uh, Wagle, I'm sorry if I pronounced your last name incorrectly. How do you differentiate between strength and stability, or are they the same? Uh, well, yeah, stability is, it's all part, of, for me, it's all part of the same continuum. Right, because if we think about stability, my question would be, are we thinking about stability in the stillness or in the motion context? Right, so if we think about for a second the shoulder musculature, right, the rotator cuffs, and we were, I was taught when I was at university that the rotator cuff group were there to stabilize the shoulder. And yet when you think about that logically, uh, if ground reaction force was present through the shoulder, I'm, I've got my hands on the ground. Uh, if I'm throwing, uh, or you know, I've got some velocity and momentum and speed associated with shoulder motion, uh, or if my big 
phasic muscles, lats and, and chest, are moving and exerting their influence of force through the glenohumeral joint. They're going to go, the glenohumeral joint is going to go where the phasic muscles, the velocity and the ground reaction force want it to go. And then the rotator cuff mus muscles are not there to keep it still. They're there to turn on and off at the right time to guide the, the motion so that it has um, an optimal instantaneous axis of rotation, which simply means it's at the right place at the right time. And if you look at any throwing EMG studies, uh, you're going to see that those rotator cuff muscles, if they're working well and optimally, they're going to be turning on and off, on and off, on and off, on and off. So those stability muscles are not designed to stay on. They're designed to stay on and off to guide the joint. And that's what stability is. It is a body-wide influence of type 1 through type 2 A and B fibers that can coordinate through the nervous system to guide the joint or a series of joints to express healthy, repeatable, optimal motion. So uh, it, it is really about coordination uh, as well as strength, as well as sequencing. And that's what stability is. And then there's other muscular, excuse me, there's other tissue like uh, fascia, like skin, like water, that all create space so that we can organize stability. Think about the discs in the back. If they start to shrink, you know, good luck for, you know, your, your segmental stability mechanism to be enhanced in the lower back. So all of these things are part of a very complex narrative that, uh, that would speak to kind of um, stability. So I'm not sure if you have any thoughts there, but it is a complicated but a very good question that we should be asking more. Yeah, I think inherent with any good movement, you have, you have stability, but combined with mobility, which is essentially what Michelle was saying, and for us, I think what that means from a bone perspective, a joint perspective, is you have two bones that approximate each other, and as you're moving dynamically, these bones aren't smacking into each other. They're staying afloat as you're moving dynamically, and it's a result of a lot of these stabilizing muscles to be turning on and on to guide these bones so they aren't colliding with each other. Because otherwise, you'd end up getting a lot of friction and a lot of uh, compact stress into the articular cartilage, and to the bone itself, and that's where you develop bone spurs or you wear out the cartilage. If I overstabilize the motion, right? If I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about what muscles to turn on when I'm doing a particular motor task, that overstability actually impairs the ideal rhythm and timing of the two bones as they move. So if I've got a muscle that's always on and it's not turning off at the appropriate time, you overstabilize the motion. And what ends up happening is those two bones, when you turn a muscle on and you keep it on, those two bones start to come together, and now you're moving with less joint space. That starts to lead to rigidity of movement and more wear and tear. And so for us, stability must be congruent with mobility, meaning that we are moving dynamically through space and controlling that. And you see that when the person's moving smoothly as they transition from one posture to another, right? And that's why the idea of kind of loaded motion is always sub-maximal in nature, guys, because if it's maximal in nature, we reduce degrees of freedom, as we should, and then motion is not necessarily three-dimensional motion, a task-specific motion is not necessarily what we want as much as it is loading the tissue. Uh, so, you know, as your load goes up and up and up and up and your degrees of freedom go down, uh, you know, then the narrative starts to change slightly, but we want to express motion and have the body segments organized through the stability elements, type 1, and then type 2 muscles as well. Speaking of which, do you want to do a little uh, power? Yeah, let's do it. Uh, so power, I'm going to start off with a lighter load because uh, I want to move explosively. That means high amount of force while moving quickly, so it's important that I start at least initially loading my body with lighter load, especially if I want to move dynamically. So, uh, was it uh, this morning? I think we posted a video where we were doing what's called the, uh, the lateral chop. So we're doing a chopping motion, but moving in the front in the frontal plane as we do it. We start in a neutral position, but then we end up landing across the body in a split stance, and then we walk our way back. And so, at full speed. I'm learning how to stabilize myself and not over-rotate as I move this mass, drive down towards the ground with a lot of acceleration, but at the same time, 
I have to have the motor sequencing to stop me from going too far into that motion as well. So for the, uh, the, the anti-rotation that's out there, what I love about this is it's teaching you how not to over-rotate when moving a mass across the body. So let's talk about regressions for this, right? So regressions, obviously things simple as lightening the load, reducing the speed, uh, those are very effective, simple, but very effective strategies. One thing that we're also looking at as it relates to power is how we can actually get to the idea of plyometrics by looking at chunking it. So we might say, teach acceleration first, then teach deceleration, then teach conversion. So another way of saying it is, if you accelerate first, you're, you're teaching the muscles to act. If you're decelerating next, let's say later on in your progression schemes, you're getting the muscles to be acted upon. And then conversion is both, right? They get acted upon, they convert, stretch reflex, monotonic, uh, you know, kind of facilitation. We are um, capturing energy and then we convert that with an amortization phase. So that's great. So can we get the muscles to act? Can we get them to be acted upon next? And then can we convert that from the potential of stretch, right? So through plyometric actions. So can we go through a scenario where, let's break this down, and let's go through acceleration first, then deceleration, and then I don't know if there's a way to convert that, but we can talk about sure. it. Sure. Uh, and if we were to, I mean, let's maybe just get rid of the, the lateral kind of bound, if you will, too, right? right? If we wanted to regress this to yeah. So what I might do is first start off just in the split stance, yeah. because that's where i got to learn how to land, right, to begin with, right? And then from here, it's all about simply just chopping across my body, sinking into the hips and then and bending the knees at the same time. So I'm going to be here and then come across, hold, and then come back up. And I'm purposely thinking about stopping. I'm accelerating down to the ground as hard as I can, but I'm purposely thinking I'm going to stop this at knee height. So I'm going to imagine there is a wood block, right? I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm on the farm and I'm chopping wood. Not that I've ever been on a farm or I've ever even chopped wood. But that's where I'm going, and then from here, as I come across the body, I'm going to imagine that I'm chopping right here. I, kind of, I like that speed, too, for the, the, the novice, right? Yes. So, you know, we're talking power, but we're talking about developing power. So, you know, this speed, you got it. And I might even say, hey, listen, that's a little much, too much deceleration. I'm making this up. For me, let's say, right? Yeah. So, let me start you in a dead position down here. So, let's go into that position right here, okay. right? We get your back where we need it. We get your hips where we need it and you're gonna teach the muscles to act. So you're actually going in the opposite direction. So you're going from here up, and then you pre-position down there, and then you come up, right? And then you eventually get that with greater speed, and that is actually teaching the musculature to accelerate what's going to be decelerated. That's the kind of acceleration first, then the decel, and then we convert them both, right? And so that would be something that we might say is an effective strategy to get an individual up to the capabilities where your video on the website is, right? Because you move well at speed. And what we don't want to do is to drive that with an individual that may not have the competencies that you have yet, but can get there eventually. And we might get the acceleration first, then the decel, then the conversion over a period of time. Okay. Yeah. I think a, a simple progression to this yep. is, and what I like about the, the size of the Viper here, is let's say I wanted to work now driving through more rotation through the body. I go to a wide grip. So if I do the same task at hand, my body, because of the wide grip and my, my height, that matters too, I have to now rotate more. I have to load this particular myofascial sling from the lat to the thoracolumbar fascia into the opposite glute, right. I gotta teach that mechanism to uh, move me more into that direction while still loading. That would be a, a simple way to progress this, uh, but yet still from a tissue demand, we actually increased it pretty big. Sure. Yeah. And really the rotation we want coming through the hip structure so that we can prevent any type of rotation and flexion under load in the spine itself. So that's the, that's the progression, what you're talking about. We see competency in the ability to execute with velocity and, and, and power and strength in the mass itself, 
And then we look at the competency within the joints, in this case hip joint, to go through internal rotation to get that posterior glide so that we can actually effectively move through the hip. So, um, yeah, that's, you know, that's our kind of approach to ideas around power. And the one that we posted, I think, today on social media was, uh, was Derek doing an effective job showcasing uh, some of those power, uh, in this case, deceleration drills. Awesome. Uh, Amy Slater has a great question. Hi, Amy. Uh, would you recommend shifting patterns for diastasis recovery? Uh, the, the, yeah, and she has a quick comment to help with that. So traditional models recommend against recruiting obliques because it pulls at the diastasis. Uh, I used Viper through both twin pregnancies, including shifting patterns, and found success at reintegrating the core. As a general rule, can you suggest an explanation? Thanks so much. So I think there's a couple of things. What we want, it's all about dosage and uh, all about the, um, uh, the amount of contraction to pull a disrupted area, yeah. right? And so what we might go to is uh, standing, not laying down. Because as soon as you start laying down, there is more uh, torque that is created and there's more muscle recruitment and more force generation being given to the abdominal wall when we're laying down. You know, think about plank, think about a reach, think about, you know, crossovers and, and uh, all these abdominal bicycles. There's a lot of force that is, you know, kind of used or called upon in the abdominal wall. But if we were to go back to your scenario, scenario standing up, creating different positions of feet, and even going through different tilting patterns, what we're going to call upon is lumbopelvic hip uh, musculature and coordination through the nervous system without all of the tissue stress because uh, compare that with a sit-up, let's say, right? There's gonna be a lot less force that is required, but a lot more coordination patterns. And then like everything else, it's a wash, rinse, repeat, as you're putting more force through the area, sub-maximal force, uh, and allowing those tissues to remodel. Uh, so what we might say is get the pelvic floor, get the, the pelvis, and get the abdominal wall. And we can do that through various different foot patterning, and then various different uh, tilting sequences as well to keep the stress levels low on the pull of the muscle itself, but still stress going through the connective tissue and muscle so that it can actually start to uh, begin its adaptive process of getting stronger. It's a great insight, right? Because from a tissue perspective, you know, we, we have not consider that being on the ground for the core musculature is more stressful to its torque, right? Although we don't often think, oh, you're just lying down, that's easier. Well, maybe from a neurological perspective it is, but from a tissue to that, it's actually harder. So doing upright loaded movement training, there may be some efficacy there. It would be great, obviously, if some researchers now started to tackle that in, in, in more specificity. But it makes a lot of sense that, you know, let's challenge this core structure in variable ways in an upright position because you get the whole body integrated. We're not asking for one aspect of the body to do uh, the task at hand. We're asking the entire body to contribute. And if we choose a safe parameter, a safe environment to do so, uh, that's going to help us keep the exercise safe, but still effective. Right. Yep. Yeah, good. We got, yes. What are we, what are we doing on time here? Uh, I want to be respectful of time. Totally. It's 45 right now. Michelle and DP loving this live presentation. Thanks. Gabriel Hildago. I, I was just with Gabe. Who was it? Two, two days ago. Um, so, listen, I... We, we love the comments, we love the interaction, and I think this is something that our team wants to do more and more. And so if that resonates with you, we'd love your feedback, uh, continue your comments. We'll, we'll get offline and we'll, we'll answer some of these as well uh, in pretty real time. And so we just really appreciate all your attention. Um, we, like we said before, our lane really is, uh, for this Viper Pro, is a professional conversation. And that's with fitness professionals, health professionals, that's with uh, athletic development, condition professionals, S&C coaches, uh, research. Derek Vandenbrink's done some great research that we're going to illuminate and bring to you guys. Uh, and then older adults, special populations, of course, very important. But we want to stay in this lane because it's authentic to us. You know, the reason why this was created, Simon and I, way back when, took a look at farm kids and thought maybe we could train hockey players to be better at hockey based on the odd position lifting that, uh, farm kids has because they have because anecdotally they were better in their sport and by better I meant stronger on the puck right they seem to be very strong in 
different positions in positions that athletic endeavors require. And as we dug through this, we found more and more efficacy from the motor position, from the mechanical viewpoint, uh, from the structural viewpoint. And so, you know, that is what we want to share in a two-way conversation with all of you. So I don't know if you have any parting thoughts here, DP, at all, but um, it, it, this is fun to do. I, I really enjoy doing this. Yeah, as, as long as everybody finds value from this, we'll continue to do this. Uh, I, I, you know, I got my geek hat on. We, I love to geek out with this guy. I love to geek out with you guys. And uh, I think the more we do this in a community-based environment, I think we all move forward and become better practitioners for the people that we're looking to serve. So thanks yeah. for watching. Perfect. So uh, if, if you guys have questions, keep it coming. We'll sign off for now, and then um, we'll post the next time we go live, which shouldn't be too far from now. And we'll uh, we'll tell you clearly what we're going to be talking about. So I guess, I guess that's it for now. Thanks, guys. Thanks a lot, guys. Appreciate it.